Welcome to the stage, co-founder of Flourish Trust and chairwoman of the board of Unreasonable Group, Christiana Musk. And it's my great honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, whose intellectual pursuits have ignited a profound shift in our understanding of human history, spirituality, and the power of ancient knowledge. Brian Murescu is a visionary author with a background in law and classicism who will stop at nothing to unearth the fragments of our human history to help us recompose who we are, where we came from, and who we might become. Brian is a true thought leader whose groundbreaking research has opened the doors to a forgotten world of ancient wisdom on humanity's relationship with psychoactive plants and fungi. Drawing upon his extensive studies in classical languages and literature, Brian has shed light on the role of psychedelic substances in the ancient world, a revelation that challenges the conventional narrative surrounding the nature of consciousness and spirituality. In his critically acclaimed book, um, The Immortality Key, The Secret History of the Religion with No Name, has become a bestseller captivating readers worldwide with its groundbreaking exploration of the ancient rituals and mysteries that have shaped our understanding of religion. Get ready to be inspired, enlightened, and also maybe challenged as he invites us to reimagine our place in the world and reevaluate the deep connections between past, the present, and the future. Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Brian Murescu. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Hello, Summit. Uh, my first time at Summit. The room filled up, shit. Okay. Um, uh, we have some slides here, uh, which I'll get into, um, and I'll describe what I've been up to for the past 15 years of my life, and I'll try and be brief over the next 30 minutes, and then Christiana and I will do a conversation afterwards. Uh, so here, slide number one, uh, the answer to life, the universe, and everything. This is, this is my, uh, my proposed answer uh, to the best kept secret in history and the key to the survival of the human species on planet Earth and beyond. Um, in, in, moder in modern Greek, it goes like this, an pethanis, prin pethanis, denta pethanis, o tan pethanis. If you die before you die, you won't die when you die. Uh, it sounds like a riddle because it is a riddle. I'll, I'll explain what I think it means. Uh, I spent 12 years of my life, true story, looking for a single chalice, this, this, this solitary chalice, which is only about an inch high, and it showed up in Spain, of all places. Why would you spend 12 years of your life looking for a chalice? Um, I think this chalice could be one of the most important archaeological discoveries in the history of Western civilization, and I'll explain why. It all goes back, well, to the 1930s, really, uh, but the story picks up in 1978. There are three renegades who write a book called The Road to Eleusis in 1978. Uh, it starts at the top left with Albert Hoffmann, the Swiss chemist who famously synthesizes LSD in his laboratory in 1938, doesn't discover its hallucinogenic properties until a few years later. He teams up with a guy called Gordon Wasson, R. Gordon Wasson, who in 1955 rediscovers uh, the potency of psilocybin-containing mushrooms in Oaxaca, Mexico, famously writes about it two years later. And underneath them, although they had a pretty cool idea, they needed a classicist to complete this triumvirate of renegades. That's Carl Ruck. Uh, Carl Ruck, in that picture on the bottom left, is about the same age that I am now, in his, in his early 40s. And the three of them teamed up and had this idea. They thought the ancient Greeks were using psychedelics to find God. And they thought that the earliest Christians may have picked up some of this technology as well. Uh, if that doesn't sound controversial today, that was pretty damn controversial uh, 40 or so odd years ago. Um, it really affected Carl Ruck's career. Uh, he was a tenured professor at Boston University, so they couldn't get rid of him. But they basically ostracized him, ridiculed this hypothesis, uh, and he became what I call the black sheep of the classics estate. Um, so 1978, this comes out. That's Carl um, in modern day uh, life a few years ago in his home in Hull, Massachusetts. Um, and what they proposed as the answer to this long running mystery, and the mystery we're talking about here is, um, can really be summed up at the mysteries of Eleusis. Um, how many folks have heard about Eleusis? 
ancient Eleusis. Okay, fair enough. For, the, for those who haven't heard about Eleusis, Eleusis was the Mecca of the ancient world. Uh, Eleusis was the Vatican of the ancient world. It was the holiest site in the ancient Mediterranean. For 2,000 years, pilgrims from all over the Mediterranean world would descend on Eleusis, today modern Elefsina, to consume a potion called the Kikion, the ingredients of which we think we know, the secret ingredients we don't know, uh, but they would make this pilgrimage from Athens to Eleusis, they would consume this beverage, and they would be initiated into the holiest of mysteries of ancient Greece. And when I say they, I mean folks like Plato, folks like Sophocles, folks like Cicero, and even Marcus Aurelius centuries later. It was considered so holy that the Romans didn't get rid of it. It survived through the Greek world, into the Roman world, into the Christian era, like I said, for 2,000 years, on the promise of immortality. Anybody who came to Eleusis, it was said, would discover the secret of immortality. They would never die. And there was something about this potion that convinced people they would never die. And so what do Albert Hoffman and, and Gordon Wasson and Ruck say? They say, well, they must have been doing psychedelics. Um, there must have been something, must have been something in that cup. Um, and, and their hypothesis, leave, leave it to Albert of all people, uh, they, they, they hearken on this fungus, which if you haven't heard of it, it's called ergot. Uh, ergot is that blackened sclerotium on the bottom there, out of which burst these beautiful purple mushrooms. And if you didn't know it, that's where LSD comes from. That's how Albert Hoffman synthesized LSD. So it's a fairly elegant hypothesis because it's a very naturally occurring fungus that has been around with humanity as long as humanity has been uh, growing bread, having agriculture, at least 12,000 years. It could, be, it could be far longer. So in principle, it's, it's a pretty decent theory, but there's no real data. There's no real evidence to support it in science and technology one way or the other in 1978. There's lots of good hints, lots of good clues. There's some iconography, some literature you can point to that maybe there was something psychoactive, visionary in this, in this compound, uh, but nothing to really prove it. So um, I decided it was time to try and prove this once and for all. Um, and I go, to, I go to Greece, this is in 2018, at the site in Eleusis, which we'll talk more about. Um, and I, I fly over there to ask one question of the one person who I thought had the answer to this long-standing mystery because the sciences have been improving in the 80s and 90s and 2000s and we have the internet and we have smartphones, and we have Taylor Swift and we have all kinds of good things that make the world modern and beautiful. And I thought, has the science progressed far enough uh, for us to test one of these ancient chalices. There's, there's this new science of archaeochemistry. There are botanists who would love to take a look at any artifacts that have been excavated over the past hundred years at this site. And so I ask, I ask the archaeologist on site, Papi Papangeli, I say, Papi, uh, can, can, we, can, can, we, can, we test, can we test one of these chalices? And the answer is no. Uh, and, and the answer is no, not because she wasn't interested and didn't want to test them. The answer is no, because everything they've excavated for decades uh, has been cleansed for conservation purposes. And in, in cleansing these artifacts, unfortunately, they've scooped out the secret magic ingredient, which no one ever talked about, no one ever wrote about, and so there goes the evidence. And that's a hard no. And I'll explain why that's a hard no, because there's a much bigger story for me ending up at Eleusis. I'm not a classicist, I'm not an archeologist. Um, at the time, I wasn't a writer or a journalist. I was, I was a dad. I was a dad and a husband. Um, who didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. My, my <laughs> my, my life story in 60 seconds goes like this. I'm born to an Irish, Romanian, humble working class family in Philadelphia. Um, at 14, my dreams of being an NBA basketball star are quickly diminishing. So it's time to invest in education. I take an entrance exam to an all boys Jesuit school in Philadelphia called St. Joe's Prep and I'm taught Latin on my very first day, and I fall in love with it. And the next year, I'm learning Greek. So for four years, I have Latin and Greek, um, and it's not my parents, because they hadn't gone to college, none of my brothers went to college, but it was my Greek professor who helped me uh, fill out college applications and send me on trains for college visits, and I was recruited by Brown University to continue studying Latin and Greek. And so I arrive in Providence, Rhode Island, the first person in my family to go to college, and with the world's resources at my fingertips, my, my plan for financial success is to double down on dead languages and pick up, pick up Sanskrit. I, I literally, literally majored in Sanskrit. And, and Latin, 
and Greek and classical Arabic. Um, and when I was 21, realized I was shit out of luck. Um, so I took the LSATs, turned a, a hard left turn into law school, and went straight to Wall Street and sold out as hard and quick as I could. So I get to Wall Street. Uh, I'm at Millbank Tweed Hadley McCloy in 2005. I'm on my first call with Goldman Sachs, and I don't know what a basis point is. Um, and the partners are like, dude, the Sanskrit's not going to help. Like, it, you, you at least read the Wall Street Journal or like read The Economist once in a while. Um, so I subscribed to The Economist and never read it. And so there was a, sta a stack of economists piling up in the corner of my office on the 57th floor overlooking the East River. Um, and one day in 2007, for, for no reason whatsoever, I pulled out one looking for anything that wasn't about finance. And there was an article entitled The God Pill. And it was one of the first write-ups uh, from Johns Hopkins with the Roland Griffiths lab talking about psilocybin. And it mentioned how some of these early volunteers, 2006, uh, reported their one experience of psilocybin as among the most meaningful experiences of their entire lives. And at that moment, like, uh, my, my life can be measured by that moment. There's my life before I read that article and afterwards. Because if you were to devise a better definition of the ancient mysteries, you couldn't devise a better definition than the culminating experience of a lifetime, a visionary, impactful event on, of, over a single intervention that completely transforms the way a person thinks. Um, and from that moment on, I was hooked and I thought there was something to be discovered here. I thought, I sensed that Carl Ruck was right. I'd read his book in the 90s. I thought they were right about this. Um, and so more years go on. I leave Wall Street. I go to the international banking community in Washington, DC. Uh, we have a baby. My wife is pregnant with our second baby, nine months pregnant, and I quit my job. I, I quit my job, and my wife, who's here, thank you, PJ, I said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I have to solve this goddamn mystery. Um, and so I threw my pension in the trash. <laughs> the pension goes to the trash. Uh, the baby is born. They're beautiful and happy and healthy. And that's why when I heard no, that's an existential moment for me because there, there is no plan B and there's no plan C for me. Um, so I had to find that chalice. Um, and I had to look elsewhere. So, uh, in those years, I was reading everything I could about these ancient mysteries. I was going through peer-reviewed literature in every language I could find, not just English. I was looking in German, Portuguese, Italian, Spanish, and for some reason, a Spanish researcher had mentioned something about this, about this brew, about this potion, and this strange archaeological discovery from the 1990s that nobody had ever heard of for some reason. And it was in this place uh, that you can see there, which is not Greece, that's Spain. It's called Emporion in the ancient world. Today it's called Ampurias or Empurias. Um, and in the 1990s, they did some excavations not far from there in a place called Pantos. And what they found was a very Greek sanctuary, a very Greek feeling sanctuary. Um, these, were, these were initiates who uh, sailed across the Mediterranean from mainland Greece and what today we call Turkey to found this place. Uh, Pantos. There was a domestic chapel there, inside of which they found all kinds of Greek elements. They found an altar, for example, which on petrographic analysis uh, was confirmed to have originated at the Mount Pentelicus quarry in Greece. So this stuff came from Greece. The, the coins uh, featuring Persephone, the same goddess who's worshipped over in Greece, came from Greece. Those greco italic amphorae all came from the old world. That's uh, what the archaeologist describes as a, a thymiateria, an incense burner featuring Demeter. You have a, a vase, which looks like it belongs on a, on a Greek dining table, somehow over in Spain, featuring the god Dionysus, the goddess of madness and ecstasy and rapture. And inside that chapel, they found these. They found these tiny chalices, these tiny chalices in the 1990s. And that's a very Greek chalice in the middle there. It's called a kanthros. The shape is a kanthros. It's the exact shape of the cup that is used by the disciples of Dionysus and these mysteries to consume uh, some sort of magical potion to uh, commune with the gods. And so... Uh, for some reason, in the late 90s, they did uh, an analysis of that cup, and what they found was beer residue, which is really interesting, because why would you drink beer from such a, a tiny shot glass? So that, that in, in and of itself, was, <laughs> was kind of strange. A pint would make more sense. Um, so, so clearly, there was something about 
what was in that chalice that made it magical and potent. In addition to the remains of beer, they also found the microscopic remains of ergot. The ergot that Professor Ruck had been looking for for 40 years of his life. And I used this joke last week in Paris, but that is the most excited he was the entire day to see this one. I don't know this, he's stone cold Ruck. Um, he, on the inside, he's happy. And, and he's vindicated. So we flew, we flew to the museum in Spain to see the chalice up front and live uh, for the first time. And, and what he's looking at, uh, as I mentioned, is one of the most significant discoveries, I think, in the history, certainly of Mediterranean architecture um, and archaeology. Um, and I think uh, it, it points to the possibility that something like a psychedelic brew, an ergotized beer, an LSD-like potion was being consumed by initiates of these ancient mysteries, at least here. And so there's, there's a compelling argument that can be run for what was happening in ancient Greece and, and, and parts elsewhere. Um, and this is what an artist thinks was happening there. Um, What's unique to point out is that it's, it's, it's being run by women, which is one of the biggest themes of my book, which I haven't mentioned yet. Um, these, these rites were all female rites of initiation. The rites of Eleusis originated as rites that were led by women for women, and only later were men invited to drink that potion and take part in these rites of immortality. So that's probably what was happening in this second century BC chapel in Spain 2,200 years ago. Some sort of priestess uh, with the sheaves of grain invoking Demeter and Persephone, uh, a sorceress ladling out the magic beer, a young child holding the skull of an ancestor. In addition to the chalice where they found the ergotized beer, Inside the jawbone uh, of a deceased relative they found there, they also found the remains of ergot. So it really does point to some sort of intentional consumption of a very magic potion happening there. Okay, that raises the big, that's all prequel. That's all prequel, by the way. The big question is this. Okay, um, so this is not a trick question. What, what year is it? What year is it? Okay, 2023. It was a trick question, actually. Uh, so there's, there's lots of calendars. And there's a Jewish calendar, there's a Muslim calendar, there's a Chinese calendar. Most people around the world, for some reason, um, reference 2023. So whether or not you're a believer in Jesus Christ, by using this calendar, we're all counting time and marching to Christ. Um, and I think that we don't often think about the, the origin story for what that really means. It's part of our identity crisis. Um, how many presidents of the United States of America have not been Christian? The answer is zero. I'll ask in this room, open question, how many folks consider themselves Christian and go to church on Sundays or regular services? Wow. <laughs> I saw one person ha half raising. Like in, in a <laughs> okay. So we have a problem here. We have to address our calendar, or we at least have to ask what happened 2,000 years ago that transformed the world as we know it to the point where we're counting time by Christ. Um, something very profound happened, and nobody knows exactly what happened, and I submit that everything we just talked about, about what was happening in ancient Greece, was happening in the earliest Christian communities, and there's an obvious reason for that. Although Jesus is born in the Holy Land, the, this new religion takes root in the Greek-speaking world of the Mediterranean, right? So think about the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all written in ancient Greek to Greek speakers who would have been very, very familiar with everything I just said about the mysteries of Eleusis, about Dionysus, about magic potions. This is the kind of stuff that classicists study and talk about. This is the stuff that Karl Ruck was researching and writing about, um, Harvard and Yale trained, by the way. Um, and it's not quite openly spoken about in public for some reason. But we're all trying to figure out the roots and the origins of this religion that transformed time as we know it. And I think that if we looked back into those ancient chalices in Christianity, we might find a different story like we found among the early Greeks. So that's why I spent so much time in the Vatican. I went through the Vatican's secret archives. I went through the archives of the Inquisition. I went through the catacombs. And I spent a lot of time in the museums um, looking for evidence of something like a psychedelic brew 2,000 years ago.
And this is what you find when you go down to the catacombs under the streets of Rome. This is the, the earliest evidence for the world's biggest religion, which now counts two and a half billion people. Nobody here, but two and a half billion people, <laughs> two and a half billion <laughs> around the world think this is pretty important. Um, and when you, <laughs> when you go in and look at their, at, their, at their frescoes, there's some cool stuff there. There's some cool stuff. So they're writing in Latin in the third century AD. This is generations after Christ, in the third to the fourth century. They're writing in Latin, but they're, again, they're, they're, they're ensconced in, this, in this, Greek, uh, this, this Greek milieu. And so what you see written there is misce mi Irene, agape misce. Misce is such a common word in Latin that it goes to us in English. You probably know what it means. It means mix, misce. Why are you mixing wine instead of pouring wine? Anybody who would have looked at this image uh, 1,700 years ago would have known what they were doing because classicists know that wine is never poured. It's always mixed with herbs and toxins and spices, perhaps mushrooms and plants to achieve the desired effect. Sometimes to kill people, Socrates drinks wine with hemlock, sometimes to heal people, sometimes to divine the future, and sometimes to commune with your God. So right there written in Latin um, in stark red, is the, the ritual Eucharistic celebration that the earliest Christians would have found underground. Irene da calda, calda. Nobody knows what calda means, even classicists, but this one guy, 100 years ago, clearly thought it meant a mixture of hot water, wine, and drugs. What kind of drugs? What kind of drugs were being consumed by the earliest Christians in catacombs? And why are they in catacombs? You should be asking in the first place. Uh, the reason is because there's no churches. There are no physical churches for 300 years after Christ. It's also an illegal religion that people were being killed and persecuted for. This is an underground religion that people celebrated in private dining rooms, in homes with small crowds, smaller than this crowd even, um, and in, in cemetery chambers, basically. It's a very different religion. And so as different as that is from modern Christianity, so too is the wine of the time. And again, this is, it's very well understood that the wine 2,000 years ago was unusually intoxicating, seriously mind-altering, potentially lethal, and occasionally hallucinogenic. And I can point you to the Greek and Latin. This is, this is Dioscorides, who writes at the exact same time that those Gospels written in Greek are being drafted. Um, in just one, one of his books, in the Materia Medica, there's 56 different wine recipes for mixing up different visionary potions. I chose just one here with Black Nightshade. He says that if you drink this kind of wine, it produces fantasias u aedais, not unpleasant visions. So a pretty kick-ass time. So that's, that's the literature. If you want to see this stuff in action, you go to the Louvre. Um, so I went to the Louvre a few years ago with my friend, Father Francis, who's an herbalist, um, a linguist, and a Catholic priest. And I, I, I brought him on this heretic's mission to find the contents of the original Eucharist. And so we got a backstage pass to this beautiful room, uh, which I wasn't able to publish in the book, uh, but I can, I can show you here for a few seconds. This is, this is backstage at the Louvre in their private collection. A hundred years ago, a German scholar named Flickenhaus uh, published a monograph talking about some of these ancient wines. And he said, aha, I found a vase that clearly shows the ancient wine mixing ceremony from ancient Greece. And if you zoom in on G408 and G409 in the Louvre, which I had to track down, uh, through the Greek ceramicist there, uh, you will find the magic ingredient they're throwing into the potion. Again, they're always mixing the wine. They're always throwing things into the wine. Uh, and Frickin House had drawn a, a line drawing 100 years ago of what he thought was in there. And it looked pretty interesting. Could have been a mushroom or an herb. So I pull Father Francis out of Italy. I fly over from Washington, D.C. We spend all this time diligencing. We're getting very close to seeing finally what the Greeks threw into their wine. And this is what shows up. Absolutely nothing. Um, Freaking house just invented whatever he thought was on the vase, and so you hit another another dead end at the Louvre, which is always a disappointing morning. Um, and so, what the hell do you do for the next six hours of your day with a Catholic priest um, before you have a liter of wine at lunch? You go to this painting, uh, which is in the same room as the Mona Lisa. And I had the pleasure of taking my, my daughters here on Saturday, last Saturday, for the very first time. 
in their entire lives, and they were thoroughly unimpressed. <laughs> they, could, they couldn't have been more unimpressed with the largest painting in the largest art museum on planet Earth. So again, this is not supposed to be subtle stuff. This is supposed to be part and parcel of our history and this world's biggest religion. Uh, this is the largest painting in the Louvre. It is the wedding feast at Cana. Folks, I'm assuming, are familiar with uh, the famous miracle in John's Gospel when the, the waters changed to wine. You don't have to go to Sunday school to know that one. Um, so in, in that famous scene, uh, Jesus here is, is brought to a wedding with his mom, the wine runs out, and, and he magically transforms, we know this from the Gospels, 180 gallons of wine. Um, and he serves it to people who are already drunk, and that's in the Greek in John's Gospel. They're already drunk, and they get 180 gallons of more wine. Um, nobody knows why, uh, but if you were a Greek speaker, you would know why how to interpret that passage, because for centuries and centuries before this wine was magically transformed at Cana on the Epiphany, celebrated to this day on January 5th and 6th, on January 5th and 6th, the exact same day for centuries and centuries before that, anybody on the Greek island of Andros would have known exactly what was about to happen. On the Greek island of Andros, and this is captured in Titian's painting, the Bacchanal, the Andrians, you can find this today. Um, what was happened uh, is that the, the water inside Dionysius' temple would magically transform into wine and flow for a week, a week worth of wine every single year, magically on January 5th and 6th. So basically what, what we're tracing here is that there's this, there's this continuity of pagan Greek traditions into the, Greek, into the Christian world, which hadn't become formally Christianized yet. So all these tropes, all, all these rituals, and including this wine, I think made its way into the early Christian church. So the question we have here, does on the left, that's Dionysus, does the only begotten son of God, born of a virgin, crowned in ivy, draped in purple, who delivers his grapes for our salvation, at some point become the figure on the right. The only begotten son of God, born of a virgin, crowned in thorns, draped in purple, who sheds his blood for our salvation. And what does that mean? What does that mean to consume the blood of Christ? For centuries, for centuries before Christ, the, the, the wine that was drunk by the initiates of Dionysus was referred to as the blood of Dionysus, the Haimabachio. And this is how they partied. This is, this is your average Dionysian revel. That's a Sunday in ancient Greece. They would, they would get hopping mad on wine. They would streak naked through the forest. They would hunt down a goat. They would bite into it and they would suck its blood from the still living goat. And that's a fun time. Um, <laughs> it sounds like Summit. So just, just to show you, I, do, I don't make this stuff up out of thin air. This is a very scholarly book by a scholar named Dennis MacDonald, the Dionysian Gospel. He calls it that way because he compared the ancient Greek of John's Gospel to the ancient Greek of Euripides and sees similarity after similarity. The language was being borrowed and co-opted for a very specific reason. John is trying to communicate to his audience that in these new mysteries of Jesus, they could very well find the old mysteries of, of Dionysus. Um, and the, the consumption of the flesh and the blood, which you're taught in Catholic school every Sunday, is not a metaphor. That is the literal consumption of flesh and blood in order to identify yourself with the God, to become one with the God. So here's the question. Is there a chance that some of this magic wine from ancient Greece made its way into at least some of the earliest Eucharistic celebrations in early Christianity? Because if it did, it rewrites in real time the entire history of the world's biggest religion and Western civilization. Um, what did I find? I wouldn't call it a smoking gun. It's, um, it's interesting evidence. In 79 AD, Mount Vesuvius, which you see in the back there, erupted. And in its eruption, it managed to preserve the contents of a giant wine dolia uh, that we can confidently date to 79 AD. Again, the same period of the earliest generations of the Christians, the Gospels are being written, Dioscorides is writing about all this trippy wine. Uh, what they found there was the dregs of wine that seems to have been spiked with cannabis, opium, henbane, and black nightshade, together with frogs and toads. So, um, not a Tuesday dinner. 
So what does that mean, the Shakespearean? It means that there is actual bona fide organic evidence, both of spiked hallucinogenic beer and spiked hallucinogenic wine at the time that the world's biggest religion and the civilization that gives birth to democracy are both in full flight. When I went to all these scholars years and years ago asking them that question, is there any data, any data at all, that the Greeks were using psychedelics, the earliest Christians were using psychedelics? The answer that comes back again and again and again is no, until now. Now we can have a real conversation. And so, thank you. So I took those two data points and I went straight to Austin, Texas to tell Mr. Rogan about it. And my, this is in September 2020, my wife uh, flees to Uruguay with our two daughters and a week later I'm in quarantine at a hotel in Montevideo talking to Michael Smirkanish about drugs and the nature of reality on Saturday morning. Um, and a lot has happened since then. So what used to be what used to be sort of a, an esoteric field of study, archaeochemistry, archaeobotany, no one really pays any attention to, Carl Ruck is lampooned and ostracized for four decades for some reason, um, is now making headlines around the world on a regular basis for reasons I can't explain. This is last month in the New York Times. Last month in the New York Times. Tripping in the Bronze Age. The Europeans had psychedelics, my friends. This is the first direct archaeochemical proof that indigenous Europeans absolutely had access to psychedelic drugs. Uh, it's, it's incontrovertible and it's undeniable. In addition to the spiked beer and spiked wine that I'm talking about, the, the team here in Menorca, if people know where Menorca in Spain is, uh, they uncovered a cave in which hair samples had been meticulously preserved in these wooden tubes, these containers. When they tested them under um, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, what they found were the very trippy tropane alkaloids, atropine and scopolamine. Um, I'm not sure if folks have had fun with atropine or, or scopolamine, but it's a pretty trippy adventure. Um, they come from plants like datura or henbane or deadly nightshade or mandrake. It's not, it's not a fun time, um, but they knew what they were doing. They had a very, very sophisticated pharmacology. Uh, the, the scientists were able to confirm because of the concentration of these alkaloids in the hair, that they were being consumed on a regular basis for at least a year prior to the death of the folks who were found there. Um, and this is as far back as the Bronze Age, 800 years before Christ. So 800 years before Christ, that kind of stuff is happening, which leads to the spike beer, the spike wine. What does any of this mean in my final minute before we, <laughs> before we close here? Why should anybody care about this? Um, I think we're at an inflection point when it comes to the psychedelic conversation. Uh, the, the same man who sent me down this rabbit hole uh, more than, well, about 15 years ago, Roland Griffiths, um, who folks probably know is dying of cancer, um, has, has been going off the cuff recently talking about the import of uh, this study to the future of humanity. And what he says is that because of the experience he's witnessed in the lab, um, there could be something critical to the survival of our species in the continued study of these compounds. And it's kind of funny that he, he uses that phrase um, because it's the exact same phrase that was used by an ancient initiate at Eleusis 1600 years ago. So Eleusis dies, and I'll, I'll, end, with this, I'll end with this thought. Um, Eleusis dies at the hands of the Christianized Roman Empire in the fourth century, okay? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's embittered to dust. Um, as that's about to happen, there's an initiate from Rome who was so moved by his experience at Eleusis, so moved by his consumption of that magical potion and his confrontation with, with mortality, that he, he begs the Roman emperor not to get rid of Eleusis. And what he says is that there's something about Eleusis that holds the entire human race together. There's nothing about the Greek race, there's nothing about Europeans. He says it holds the entire human species together and that in the absence of the mysteries, the Eleusinian mysteries, uh, he says, life would be unlivable, abiotos, he says in Greek, unlivable on planet Earth, which raises a profound question. Um, it might just be possible that whatever magic they discovered and perpetuated at Eleusis for 2,000 years, um, although it went away for the past 1,600, 
and we'll talk about this in a couple of minutes, um, we might be living at the time when that magic and that mystery is being resurrected in real time to save a species at risk, a planet in crisis, and a consciousness in need of healing. Um, so with that, I'll stop and say thank you. So don't leave everybody. He's not done. He's not done. We're, we're now going to do some question and answers and dig deeper. And um, um, unfortunately, I'm not allowed, permitted to ask questions from the audience. So I'm trying to aggregate what I think you all might be thinking and try to ask those questions here. And uh, then you guys can uh, attack Brian in the hallways later to ask him all your questions. Anyway. I'm leaving. I'm leaving. <laughs> He's going to be helicoptered out. <laughs> All right. So, wow, Brian, what a tremendous scope of research it took, you undertook to make this book happen. Um, wow, 12 years, like, as you mentioned, it's no, no small feat. Um, and thank you for summarizing all that for us quickly. And there, there's certainly a lot that got left out. So everyone really needs to get the book. Um, but, you know, it strikes me that by by being outside those narrow confines of academia, you've been able to act as sort of like connective tissue between these disparate fields and help weave together a larger story. And I'm curious, how has this been received by sort of formal academia and these, these institutions? And uh, yeah, I'll start there. Uh, it has been received shockingly well to me, to me and everybody else. This, this was my opportunity to pr uh, pretend I was a professor. Um, <laughs> and so what, what I realized is that the, the, some, some of these fields are very siloed and don't often talk to each other. And so um, like when I, when I found the, that 1990s excavated piece of pottery from, from Spain, that, that chalice, um, you know, I went to my own Greek professor who was Spanish from Salamanca and asked if she'd ever heard about that. And her answer was no. And I went to uh, Carl Ruck himself and he hadn't heard about it. And I went to one of my mentors, a guy named Greg Nagy at Harvard, who ran uh, for 20 years Harvard Center for Hellenic Studies. Um, and they hadn't heard of it either. And I, and I think the, the, there's, the obvious reason is because it was published in Catalan, okay? Yeah. So not many people speak Not surprising for those not, who spent time in Catalonia. <laughs> 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 so that's, that's the obvious reason, number one. But number two, like we're, basi uh, we're basically talking about pharmacology here. We're not and so most classicists think about, think about um, like written evidence and, and, and iconographic evidence. And so in order to, to, to piece some of this stuff together, you have to ask questions from the botanists and the ethnographers and the chemists and the archaeologists, and it's really hard to do. And we're not really trained to do that as professional academics. And so I was in this weird position of being like the guy who had You're nothing free. to lose. I would just knock on doors <laughs> and talk to people with stupid questions, and they would answer. Yeah. And I'm curious, has this unlocked further research, your inquiry? Um, again, surprisingly, yes. I think, you know, I try, I try and be very, I mean, it's a bold hypothesis. And I try and be very careful about how we how we talk and capture the the, the data. Um, and as a lawyer, I'm trained never to use uh, the word "is." It's always "maybe" and "perhaps." Uh, <laughs> so, I, I, because of that, we have some really profound conversations with colleagues at Harvard uh, and especially Yale. So, I'm happy to to say that uh, earlier this year, Yale, as a matter of fact, um, and we had some some funding to help support this, uh, just announced the launch of uh, an initiative in ancient pharmacology. So, Yale now has a formal uh, program in ancient pharmacology looking into these kinds of questions in the most sober and rigorous way possible out of the Peabody Museum, which is one of the, like, the proudest things that, that has happened as, as a result of this book. That's amazing. I mean, I've been with you in some of these different academic meetings. And what's been interesting is that we, we know that uh, the psychedelic research for different mental health uh, benefits and properties got locked out and forbidden in the US and beyond. But we don't realize that the, the, these questions also got locked out of historical research, cultural research, the humanities. And so what I've heard, um, you know, researchers say is, Thank you, Brian, for an opening up the door to questions we've been wanting to ask for decades. Um, and so thank you for that. That's really profound. Um, so, yeah, actually speaking about like moving beyond, you know, the, the discourse right now on psychedelics is very much um, informed by all the new research that's happening in these, um, you know, in, in the study of the pathologies. So we've got 
you know, treatments for PTSD, for uh, substance abuse, for um, anorexia, for chronic pain. We have, you know, Dr. Carhart Harris that we heard from today, who's one of the leaders in that field. Um, so much because of all this promise in treating this disor these disorders, we sort of like now medicalizing, you know, the discourse around psychedelics. And what I'm curious about especially from reading some of these patient transcripts that have gone through psilocybin experiences, they seem to have, you know, for lack of a better word, mystical qualities and properties to the experience itself. And so do you think there's evidence to say that these mystical states are themselves healing? Uh, yes, I think, I mean, and, and I, I cite this paper a lot because Roland wrote it. This is a paper in 2018 from Roland Griffiths and Fred Barrett uh, who I was talking to this morning. Um, there's a paper in the current topics of behavioral neurosciences entitled Classic Hallucinogens and Mystical Experiences, where they, they take a look at the, the volunteers over the past 20 years. And what they noticed is that the, the greater the depth of the so-called mystical or mystical type experience, the, the, the greater the trajectory of the therapeutic benefit and outcome for all these different conditions, right? Which is, which is hard to explain in the first place anyway. And there's, and there's a great debate over whether something physiological or purely psychological is happening and the debate will continue. But I think the fact is that people have very meaningful things happen to them in six to eight hours that are very difficult to explain that they find personally significant. And those are often things that transcend the ability to describe. Uh, they're ineffable, they, they, um, they transcend time and space. There's this concept of this, this unit of experience, this, this sense of sacredness, this, this deeply felt positive mood. And the thing is it lasts, right? It lasts from a single intervention. So however we describe it, you know, the researchers noticed this, by the way, in the 50s and 60s. And I think we kind of lose sight over the, the psycho-spiritual aspects of this experience, which is all you find when you look into antiquity. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, I was um, I was at a conference where Michael Pollan was on stage and there was an audience question and the audience said, how long have humans been taking psychedelics? And, um, you know, he said, well, we you know, we don't know, but maybe at least 10,000 years in North America we know about. And then he cited your work about how, you know, there's just this increasing evidence on, um, unfolding about the use of um, these psychedelic compounds in a sacred container in uh, throughout the, our Western civilization. And it just was so profoundly mind blowing for the audience because everybody really thinks about psychedelics as being invented in a lab and then 1970s and being limited to the counterculture. But to start to imagine, you know, some of our thought leaders of Western civilization as having, you know, had these um, experiences, like you've, you're now becoming uh, one of these leaders of the new psychedelic renaissance, just that people, you know, in, in the research that you're doing, you know, validating what a lot of people have had these experiences. But um, what I, from knowing you, like you're not really interested in being a leader of a psychedelic renaissance. Right. <laughs> in fact, you still have yet to try psychedelics. Is that true? Correct. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I know. No one is allowed to spike his wine tonight, okay? I'm going to be... Standing guard, Pilar is here, we're gonna stand, yeah, no, no dosing. Okay, <laughs> but I think, you know, from, from knowing you, you know, your interest is really, how can these compounds be a lens in us asking these, like, a lens of examining consciousness, right? Yeah, I mean, clearly there's something, like, very profound happening with these compounds. And it's weird, like, because, I viewed them through the lens of, of the beer and wine in which they were being mixed for, for thousands and thousands of years. And it's way more than 10,000, by the way. Which yeah. Michael and I can talk about that. I think it's, 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 uh, it's probably hundreds of thousands, and it could be millions, uh, which is a project I'm working on with some colleagues in South Africa uh, for another conversation. Um, but I think that like, uh, there, there's something very, very profound here that we're, we're struggling to, to find a container for. And that's, I, I think that's where my interest is, that that's where my concern is. Because the more and more I went into antiquity to find the thing, like the substance, the compound, the beer or the wine, the more and more I found the ceremony, the more and more I found the ritual. 
And here we are in the 21st century in Western civilization, having effectively lost our rites of passage that were really part and parcel of how democracy and the arts and sciences came to flourish and how early Christianity managed to survive for hundreds of years. Um, and I think that we're at a moment where together, we're all trying to figure out what that container looks like. And I think that that's where my interest is. And at some point we'll, we'll have a, a gnarly journey. Yeah. <laughs> But, but actually, what is the right container for that? What is the legal container for that? What is the safe container? What is the optimal container to invite this these sacred experiences? And I, I think that that's, you know, uh, for those who've read, uh, what is it, Stealing Fire by uh, Jamie Whale and Stephen Kotler, um, they actually, they, t they talk about how our society wants to actually just ban ecstatic states, like entirely, you know, and then eventually, and so then they move underground and then eventually they sneak back up and then they have this blooming in civilization wherever, you know, it looks a lot like the paintings, uh, you know, the, the wild and naked goat eating parties and <laughs> and then powers that be say, hold on a second. Let's what are they drinking? Let's ban that. <laughs> what are they eating? Um, so, you know, and, and so there's something about these cycles in human history. And so if we're in one of those cycles today where a lot of these mysteries are becoming no so much a mystery and, you know, blooming in this renaissance, um, are we if we don't have the right containers, are we at risk of another rupture in society and these moving underground again? Yeah, absolutely. It, it could it could end tomorrow. It could end tomorrow. And I think um, there's a lot of sensitive conversations happening between universities um, and government and civil society and a lot of folks here, obviously, about what those containers look like. And I think we have to be very, very careful. I think one of those containers is clearly a medical container. And I think Michael talks about this. I think the, the relief of suffering is clearly um, is cl the front line of, of how these, these compounds can serve people in, in the coming years. And that, that's where it belongs. That's and, I don't, it belongs. and I don't want to interrupt you, but that's also, you know, classically how you see a lot of these medicines being used by shamans are healers, right? And when somebody is ill, like either the shaman or the person is taking these medicines to try to bring healing. Right. right, and I think that's fine. And but I think how how do you incorporate that into into Western allopathic medicine? What does that look like? Who's right. the best person to sit down with someone who could be experiencing one of the most profound events of their lives? Is it a classically trained psychiatrist or psychologist? Is it some other kind of facilitator? Is it someone who has deep expertise in navigating altered states of consciousness? Is it just somebody that they trust? Right? Is it mm -hmm. some? Is it, is it a caretaker? Is it a chaplain? Is it somebody who who's deeply deeply versed in the in these traditions, whatever those traditions are, whatever feels comfortable to somebody? Uh, I don't think we know the answer to that. I don't think it's 170 or 190 hours of training. Um, it's, uh, it's more or it's less? I think it's a lot less. Oh, okay. I mean, it's a lot, a lot more, more, a lot okay. more. I think it's, I think it's a, lot, a hell of a lot We have lot a workshop more. later yeah. this afternoon. You're good to go. <laughs> it's intense. I think we need to, to prepare the, the, the next generation of facilitators. There's, there's going to be a big dearth in the market uh, for that. And outside the medical system, there's a whole other conversation around what psycho-spiritual use would look like, by the way. Well, do you think, so you talk about two and a half billion people in the in the Christian faith. I mean, do you ever think Christianity or other world religions could ever reincorporate these sacred containers for entheogenic use back into their religious practices? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I hope so. I think that, again, like psychedelics are, uh, when I was writing the book, they, 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 they tend to be exoticized as something other and something, um, something that belongs to, you know, indigenous communities and in places of the world that are sometimes hard to get to, um, hard to understand and, and, and very much like uh, divorced from, from a, a, a religion like Christianity, for example, which, by the way, has interesting syncretic relationships with indigenous communities, Native American church, uh, which uses peyote as a Christian church, the Santo Daime, as you know, uses ayahuasca. So, Well, I think you write about in your book, not to interrupt you, but you, yeah. you talk about the, the Catholic church started the war on drugs because you don't go into it that much in your talk, but you say like that what happened to all these lineage of women healers passing on the wisdom, you know, from generation to generation and what happened to all these teachers and what happened to these traditions, they were wiped out pretty systematically first in Western Europe. And then when, you know, the Christians colonized the other countries, they, they worked to systematically 
wipe out entheogenic use except for those traditions that were able to incorporate Christianity, right? Right. So how do we how do we address that? How do we address, I think I think we have to rebuild some of the pieces of what that history looked like. Number one, um, I don't think this I don't think any of this is fictitious. I think I think that there's a there's a genuine story that was that was lost about the, the, the very sophisticated use of pharmacology over time. And now that we have all this new technology, um, which, is, uh, which is precision guided to, to have some of these experiences, yeah, I, I would hope that some of these big institutions can take uh, a long sobering look at, at, at the potential good that could come of this experience. And it might even get people back to church on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody here. Nobody here. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe if they were serving that wine. That's probably right. Like fine. Yeah, that's probably right. Yeah, me too. Um, so yeah, I mean, you talk about in one of your podcasts a, a little more in depth about what the Eleusis experience was like, and people would, it'd be a once in a lifetime experience that people would take a pilgrimage all across uh, the Greek empire to have this once in a lifetime experience. And it was so transformative that it was written about by all of these great Greek philosophers. So what happens to society when you can recreate this kind of experience in a safe, controlled uh, container affordably and accessibly in an afternoon? Uh, maybe it makes life livable again. I mean, I, 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 take, I take some of those prophecies very, very seriously. Um, you know, to the extent that life has become unlivable. I mean, like, like imagine, like if you were to just extrapolate, imagine 30,000 people being invited to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. every September to have a, a hero's dose of some potent medicine. Um, I think it, it would potentially impact our toxic democracy. And, and I think that was this, you know, the Eleusinian mysteries were seen as the glue of that ancient society. It wasn't something that was peripheral to everything else the Greeks were developing and it wasn't a perfect society by any means it wasn't fun to be a woman in ancient greece um but but that that experience was was, was central to to greek life and existence which is to say all these notions of like free speech and philosophy and the concept of a university and all the things that we inherited from 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 that time this experience was was central to it and so imagine and it was it was run by the state it was administered by the greek state wow it was paid for and supported by the greek state um so like imagine what that would look like today wow well do you want to share with us a little about what's happening in the lucis today Sure. <laughs> and there's somebody here who can who can speak more about it. I was talking to, to Gina just before we started. So here's a weird twist of fate. Um, so Eleusis, which we've been talking about, it's called Elefsina today. And it's a relatively small town of about 30,000 people, again, northwest of, of Athens. And of all the cities in all of Europe, it was nominated to be the European capital of culture in 2021. Uh, so Eleusis is taking the world stage for the first time in 1600 years. Now, because of the pandemic, 2021 was postponed to this year. So now in 2023, in late September, and Gina knows about this, thanks to an organization, uh, the World Human Forum, amongst others, there's a spectacular three-day event that's being organized at the archaeological site of, of Elefsina, where the Greek government, together with the EU and all these wonderful partners, um, are going to be exploring the, the ancient history of what the mysteries meant with uh, some kind of introspection about the, the technology on display here, uh, what that means for society today, how we think about psychedelics, both in the ancient past and in terms of public policy, and how we look to Demeter and Persephone and these old myths uh, today and themes of regeneration and and tapping back into ancestral wisdom. So that is an insane turn of events, by the way. That it feels more like more like fiction. Um, and Gina can talk more about it afterwards. Yeah, especially when we think back to that slide where you're like hard no, and you see you <laughs> holding your head in your hands. <laughs> that, that's right there on the very same site of Eleusis. It's, it's crazy. Back to. It's crazy. Well, you know, the words that you showed at the beginning of the slide, which is, um, you know, that's what was written over the temple of Eleusis. Is that correct? That if you die before you die, you won't die when you die. Yeah, that, that's from Athos. It's from Athos. Okay. Yeah. What, does that, what does that mean to you, Brian? Uh, okay, so that's, that's yeah, that, that, um, Okay, so that's, that, that's, the, that's the key that I talk about. So the, the key for me is not psychedelics. I recognize psychedelics as probably, almost certainly, the most potent technology we have today 
to, to catalyze the kind of consciousness that stands behind that statement, which is to say, um, by, by brutally confronting our mortality and having a very vivid death-like event through psychedelics or otherwise, um, the ancients believed that you can dissolve the self and fully enter into a notion of your truest self. That you basically, you're not, you're never learning anything new. You're, you're shedding layers of the false self and finding the true self. And with the, they, they believe the only way to do that is to basically die, to go through um, the most intense psychological death that you can experience. And to the extent that psychedelics can help support that kind of experience in one afternoon or in several sessions over many years, or maybe for one you know, unique epoch of, of your life, I do think that you're, you're sitting on the technology that could transform society and culture on the planet. Wow. <laughs> and like all journeys into the underworld and death, we need to treat it with respect and caution and reverence at that site. So I really, I really appreciate your curiosity and your approach to asking questions and inviting people and bringing them along because it, you certainly are bringing quite a lot of people along with you on this journey. Um, I, um, I'm wondering anything else that you want to share with the audience of what, I mean, there's just so much to share that I know that we only have a minute or two left, but um, is there an invitation to the audience of, um, you know, where they can follow you or learn more or? Uh, you can come find me on the boat and we'll talk. Um, <laughs> you can go to my website if you want, brianmorescu.com. Um, I, I try and be responsive on Instagram. For some reason, I'm terrible at social media, uh, but I try and respond there. Um, so you can send me a note there or uh, you can follow me on, on the website and I try and answer as many questions as I can. And, and, I, and I also know there's lots of good opportunities to, to collaborate. There's lots of good partnerships here. Um, so I really do want to talk to folks and think about um, you know, how, how we structure and think about this experience, how we have more conversations. Like my particular interest is, is, is trying to be a bridge between um, academia, as you know, ac academia and government um, and religious institutions. And so you know, uh, thought partnerships uh, around that and, and ideas that, that are sparking here. I'd love to, to talk with anybody about that. Yeah, so um, basically you have your hard book, uh, the hard copy of the book out now, The Immortality Key, and the audio book is out. The paper book, uh, paperback book is coming out in October. Um, and then if people want to follow you on your website, you're always, and social media, you're always posting when there's new research in this field and of exciting opportunities to gauge as they come up, right? I try, I try my best. Yeah, the paperback comes out in early October. Michael Pollan uh, very kindly wrote a new preface. Uh, which is very cool. And um, I'll be back talking to uh, different media outlets about what this all means and, and things that I couldn't mention here today, but I will definitely mention in October, there's a lot happening, uh, which Someone is, should make a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Someone should do that. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that eventually. All right. Thank you so much, Brian, Thanks. for being here.